Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-779-3239, or you can message the WebEx producer using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We will be holding live Q&A at the end of the WebEx seminar today. You can use the raise hand feature to the right of your name to ask a question. You will then be unmuted and be able to ask your question. Also, we encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel located at the bottom right of your screen. After typing your questions in the space at the bottom, hit the Send button, and please be sure to direct your questions to all panelists in the Ask menu. Your questions will not be seen by other members of the audience and will be addressed time permitting towards the end of the session. Now I'm pleased to turn your call over today to, to your host today, Paul Curley. Paul, please go ahead. Thank you. My, my name is Paul Curley, and welcome to the 5 to 9 webcast. First, I'd like to thank you for joining us here today. As mentioned, uh, today's webcast will be recorded and a brochure will be distributed at a later point in time. Definitely feel free to ask questions along the way and at the end. Um, and along the way as well, I'll be jumping in asking questions um, of, our, of our presenter. Topic, uh, developing an effective college financial um, you know, planning strategy. Subtitle, do your clients think 5 to 9 will negatively impact um, chances of financial aid? It's a common question, common hurdle. And, and definitely ties in very well with 529s and the very timely topic of financial aid. It's a growing area of interest. Uh, here today, we have the speaker, Steve Jobe, Director of College Savings Business Management. Um, he's with Leg Mason, which oversees over $700 billion in assets and have been managing assets for over 100 years. In the 529 space, $3.8 billion and, and has been running assets for 15 years. Continuing education, uh, that'll be you know, today's focus, um, it, and you have to stay for the full presentation in order to get the, uh, you know, credit if, if you will be, um, you know, um, submitting for that. There's going to be four learning objectives, you know, four main points, types of financial aid, financial aid uh, calculations, five steps in the college financial planning process, and also the, the 529 pros and cons in financial aid impact. As a brief, uh, um, you know, mention, there will be the 529 conference, um, you know, in September, September 11th to the 13th at the JW Marriott in Orlando. You can learn more at www.529conference.com. At this point, we'd like to um, welcome Steve Jobe uh, to, to present today's topic. Steve, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody, again, for listening today. We appreciate your time uh, and attention, and uh, I do want to um, uh, put up here on the screen the instructions for those of you who are hoping to get CE credit. As you can see, uh, we offer it for several designations, but the instructions are different by designation. For CFP, we need you to send us an email with your CFP registrant ID, and the uh, email address there is scholarschoice, all one word, at legmason.com. Uh, for IMCA, uh, same email address, uh, we will provide the IMCA program ID as soon as we get it uh, to you by email, so uh, send us an email uh, requesting that if you would. And for everybody else, uh, just uh, this is basically you're on the honor system, keep the, keep the name uh, and today's date uh, uh, of this presentation and uh, you will be able to get annual certification for that. I'll repeat these instructions at the end of the presentation as well, but uh, important to, uh, to note those as they do differ by designation. So with that, uh, Paul went through the learning objectives. Uh, we are going to focus uh, on these uh, topics today, and, um, but uh, I, I do encourage you if you have any 529 related questions at the end uh, to ask either Paul or I. So, what is the challenge? Why are we uh, here talking about this today? I don't think it's uh, any news to anybody, frankly, that the college, the cost of college has skyrocketed. Um, this is a pretty dramatic chart. We've actually uh, cut this to uh, sort of a, a more um, manageable time frame, but if you go back to 1978, which is the year I graduated from high school and started college, the, the numbers are even more dramatic. In fact, um, 
uh, that's, that's when uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics started keeping these uh, stats and college costs since 78 has risen 1,111%. Uh, but uh, in this short time frame when uh, most of you folks probably uh, have uh, uh, been out of college since 1990, uh, the cost of college has risen 347%. And as compared to the overall CPI, you can see there is only 81%, which is already a staggering number. So you can see uh, that uh, college cost has, has risen at a rate um, uh, at, at various times uh, in that period, uh, significantly outpacing inflation. So that's the problem, of course. And uh, what has that has resulted in? Unfortunately, a mountain of debt for our families and, and their kids coming out of college. And we all know that um, uh, if you've had college debt, you know what a burden that is. But it's it's also a burden on society. It means people put off having kids till later, buying a house, so it has economic impact not only to the individual but the whole country. So we would love to do whatever we can to, to help our clients, help their children, their grandchildren, and ultimately uh, help the whole country. Uh, and this uh, is a quick glimpse at, at uh, the specific college costs. These are averages uh, today. Uh, uh, four years of public school on average will cost you $96,000, uh, but you project that for a newborn today and that cost rises to 221000 Pretty staggering numbers and of course goes up even more uh, dramatically for, for private schools. So these are real numbers, real problems for our clients and uh, uh, we, we, we need to do whatever we can to help them with these challenges. This is, of course, how most of us Americans pay for college. Uh, we've uh, chopped it up into three categories here, the top two uh, being a big focus of ours today, financial aid, which comes, of course, in the form of loans, but also scholarships and grants if you're lucky, and work study if your child or grandchild is willing. Uh, but we like to say that the foundation of any uh, college plan, of course, is, is savings, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So let's focus now on these uh, various sources of financial aid. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they come in, in uh, a few flavors, scholarships, and everybody thinks their kid is the most talented athlete or the brightest in, in class. I certainly did. Um, uh, I'm one of the few who was right. But uh, scholarships, I will tell you, uh, are um, few and far between. Uh, they are often needs-based, um, but if it's merit-based uh, for academic or based on, on uh, on a student's uh, athletic abilities, um, they are rare and they rarely pay all of college. So that's a, a, something we need to manage our clients' expectations about, and that is scholarships are not as plentiful uh, as they might think, even if they do, in fact, have a kid who's as smart as mine. Grants, uh, these, of course, are the form of financial aid that do not need to be paid back um, but these two uh, are few and far between. Um, there are um, uh, both institutional um, uh, grants, meaning it comes from the school itself. Um, those are needs-based, uh, as I mentioned. And of course, the federal grants um, that don't need to be paid back, Pell, um, and, and uh, federal supplemental educational opportunity grants, those are needs-based as well. Um, uh, and the bar is pretty high in terms of the need. So even though we feel, uh, as most of us do, uh, that, that we need uh, money to help pay for our kids' college, um, the federal government has a very different litmus test, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then work study, if you're not familiar with this, this is where basically the school gives a part-time job uh, to the student, and they work off that uh, money. So it's, it's in effect a, a loan uh, of servitude, if you will. Uh, and um, uh, depending on the school, if it's a big school, there might be a lot of jobs available, but if it's a small school, there will be limits to, uh, to what can be offered, so uh, don't count on work study either. So then, um, of course, there are loans, um, and uh, of course, the states got out of the 
were forced to get out of the loan making business a while back. So it's really uh, just two sources of loans today, the federal government and of course private loans. Um, federal loans uh, are still um, uh, fairly low rates. We'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and depending on the needs of the student, the uh, repayment terms can be uh, uh, pretty favorable, uh, but um, that, that there are limits to, to those terms, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, and of course, there are private loans uh, that the, the generally the parent would get, or maybe it's a grad student who gets a loan, um, but um, those uh, generally carry a much higher interest rate. So let's talk for a moment before we get into the nitty gritty of the loans, how to apply for financial aid. So there are two types. Uh, the most popular uh, or most well known perhaps is FAFSA, uh, but CSS is increasingly uh, uh, required. So let's talk about FAFSA first. Uh, the acronym FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Every school that awards federal student aid in this country and, country, and schools uh, outside this country that accept U.S. federal aid use FAFSA. Um, there's a link there, fafsa.gov. Um, uh, actually, I think uh, fafsa.edu is where it, it redirects you these days, but either will work. Um, and that's where parents will apply online. We'll talk more about that in a moment. CSS profile, this has been around a while, the College Scholarship Service, but it's being used increasingly by private colleges and they will ask for more uh, information than the FAFSA. The FAFSA is fairly burdensome, CSS is even more so, we can talk about that more in a second. Uh, but this, like the FAFSA, is used to assess the student's eligibility uh, to, uh, to, to award financial aid, if, if at all. And you can apply online uh, 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 using the CSS profile on the College Board site, collegeboard.org. So now let's uh, focus on FAFSA for a moment. Um, you complete the FAFSA application uh, online. Uh, it used to be back in the day you could fill out a, a paper form and send it in, but of course uh, online is the way everything is going. So if you go again to fafsa.gov, fafsa.edu, uh, you can start the process online. And, and it is a lengthy process so the client can start the process, save what they put in, and then come back to that form. Uh, I don't know anybody who's been able to do it in an evening. It's pretty rigorous. <laughs> uh, but that's how you get there. Um, and uh, there are uh, loads of, uh, of pointers and, and things on the U.S. Department of Education's website, so you can go uh, there as well. But there are, of course, links uh, to a lot of that information on the FAFSA site. So how is that information used that you put into the website? So. Uh, federal, uh, state, or college-sponsored financial aid, uh, including grants, work studies, st uh, student loans, they, they are all granted uh, based on the information that you put into your FAFSA application. That is how they determine el eligibility. Um, and then uh, the, there are certain colleges that uh, award scholarships, uh, again, based on either academic merit, uh, uh, um, uh, athletic uh, skill, uh, or something else, um, uh, but they will often ask you to fill out a FAFSA form as well. Uh, so be prepared, prepare your clients to uh, be prepared to, um, to fill out a FAFSA uh, no matter what. Uh, and then how much aid, of course, the family gets is dependent on the uh, what we call EFC or expected family contribution. All the schools uh, submit to this formula, and we'll give you the specifics in a moment. But basically, it looks at assets, income, and there are other uh, uh, information, data points that they'll ask uh, to, to make that determination. And that is your uh, number. Uh, they crunch the numbers in the background. You may not even know your number, but they determine your eligibility uh, based on their algorithm. You get a number, and then that is put up against the particular college's cost of attendance, or COA, uh, and, and that's how they determine the financial need. So, so let's talk more about EFC. This is uh, a little bit complicated and a lot of confusion surrounding the, uh, surrounding the expected family contribution. Um, it takes into account, as I mentioned, uh, 
assets and income of both the student and the parent. And as you can see from this uh, chart here, uh, it's uh, more onerous for uh, the parent, uh, uh, sorry, for the student than it is for the parent. So uh, when you're putting in your uh, FAFSA uh, information, they're looking at uh, assets of the student, uh, that's, so that's any account in the student's name, uh, and then uh, any, if they had a part-time job last year, uh, they'll ask you to put in that amount and they'll expect uh, some of that to be contributed to the cost of college as well. Um, and then same for the parents, you put in all your asset information uh, and your last year's income and there's a formula for how much of that is expected to be uh, contributed to the cost of college. But again, as you can see, uh, for, student, uh, for the student, the assets, uh, their assets, 20% um, uh, of their assets are expected to be contributed to the cost of college as compared to 5.6% of the parent's assets. So uh, much more um, uh, onerous uh, for the child. And the same with the income, if they had a summer job, the school expects that half of that income from that summer job will be contributed to the cost of college, whereas for parents, it's only uh, uh, as low as 22% up to 47%. Paul, you had a comment. Yeah, and, and uh, Steve, I think another great point is the fact that that income is a much larger driver than, than assets and, and people's savings. So it's, it's just like, you know, look at that percentage, 20% versus 50. It's the income that's the large driver, not not if people save. So. It's, a, it's a great point and I'm going to come back to that in a moment uh, because uh, some people think they can just kind of tuck away uh, uh, assets, uh, hide them, and they'll get financial aid and many times they won't based on their income. Um, and then of course some other factors including how many children you have um, uh, in the family uh, and, and then how many you have in, in college at the same time. So oftentimes you'll apply for uh, for financial aid when you just have one kid in college and they'll tell you no, but then you have a second or, or, or God forbid, a third in college at the same time <laughs> and you will likely, you know, that formula changes, so you will likely get financial aid in that instance. So be sure to tell your uh, clients to fill out the FAFSA every year, even if they didn't get it the first year, especially uh, if they have more than one child in college. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people who um, uh, are concerned about financial aid and yet they are many years out from sending their kid to college. So if you have clients that fit that profile and you want them to get a glimpse into what they might get, this is not uh, binding of course because things change and every year um, their income will change and their assets will change and so what they're eligible for today uh, might not uh, be what they're eligible for tomorrow. But this calculator I found to be fairly accurate. Um, it's probably going to be bad news for your client, but it's probably good that we manage their expectations up front. So I encourage you to look at this calculator on the FAFSA website. Uh, you can go directly there by using this um, uh, uh, a URL that I have, but if you just go to the FAFSA website, um, there's a prominent link to the, uh, to the calculator. And again, um, it, it just gives you sort of a glimpse of what you may or may not get. Uh, it is not 100% accurate, but in most cases for our clients who have any means, and to Paul's uh, point earlier, uh, any significant income, it's probably going to be bad news for them, unfortunately. One thing I did want to point out, which is a recent change to the FAFSA rules, which is actually a good thing, uh, unlike so much of the news here today, um, there's an earlier application date. You used to have to wait much longer to actually start the FAFSA process. Um, it, in fact, uh, you couldn't start until January 1. Now you can start in uh, October. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the, <laughs> A lot of people may think uh, starting uh, to do uh, an onerous thing earlier is not necessarily a good thing, but why it's good is because in the past it, you, you did this process, you went through this process and you had to provide um, your estimated taxes uh, for that, that uh, previous year. So I started on January 1, 2017, I estimated the tax that I would be paying in 2000, for 2016, of course, I'm not smart enough to do my own taxes. I send it out to my accountant and I don't get it back until, you know, right before the federal filing deadline. So I had to estimate and very often I would be off and so what I'd have to do is go back 
uh, into the FAFSA website and put my actual uh, um, uh, uh, taxes paid, um, and that would certainly um, uh, skew the, the numbers for uh, financial aid. So now they've made the process easier. Basically, you, you uh, can use your uh, previous year's filing. So if I start in October 2016, hopefully I've already done my filing in uh, April of that year. I know exactly what tax I pay and I put that into FAFSA and then I don't have to go back in and put uh, a, an adjusted number. So making it a lot easier for parents um, and it means the look back period is now two years instead of one and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about why that's a good thing um, when it comes to, for example, taking money out of your 529, which is treated like income. All right, so if, um, if your client can't count on financial aid, um, which most of our clients, unfortunately, will able, be able to count on very little, if any, what, what is the solution? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, uh, but um, we'll, we'll tell you uh, that saving uh, it never is a bad idea, right? Um, so you first are going to have your clients figure out uh, where they think they're going to send their kid to college and what the cost will be. And we have uh, calculators on our website, but there's calculators all over the web uh, where you can find out what the cost of college is likely to be for that college. Or if you just think, uh, I just want to say based on the average cost of a, of a public school in state, you can uh, do it based on averages as well. Then you want to, of course, uh, identify your client's saving profile. Some may be risk averse and they'd rather uh, be conservative and not have everything they need for college but be able to sleep at night knowing uh, the stock market is not going to affect their savings. So that's for you to determine uh, whether your client uh, should be aggressive or less aggressive. Uh, you'll then set that dollar goal and then choose a savings vehicle um, and we'll talk about the various types in a moment. Um, and then of course you need to figure out what that savings schedule is. Are you going to have your client put in a lump sum? Are they going to contribute uh, once a year or are they going to save every month? Um, and as we know, the power of compounding, especially in a tax advantaged vehicle, is, is the way to go, right? Uh, so. Uh, let's talk just briefly about the various uh, forms of savings that there are, uh, some of which have advantages uh, when saving for college, others do not. Um, if you've been around this business as long as I did uh, be before um, uh, 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 I even had kids, um, uh, this was the way to, to save uh, for, for many people for college, an agma, an atma. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, 529s didn't even exist before my first child was born, and so I did in fact save in an UGMA for my first child. Um, but the good news is if you've got any clients who have UGMAs, that money can be transferred into a 529. The only caveat being, of course, if there is a, a tax due uh, on, on if, there's, if there's earnings in that UGMA, which I hope there is, then the tax will be due upon liquidation, on, uh, upon transfer of those UGMA monies into the 529 because you'll have to liquidate, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, 529s only accept cash, so uh, you can't simply put that UGMA into, uh, into the 529. You'll need to liquidate it uh, and then take the cash and put it into a, a 529. So, um, of course, from that point on, the UGMA would be um, uh, uh, tax-free, unlike it is today where you pay uh, year over year on those uh, earnings. Uh, so that would be the reason you would want to consider putting your monies, your, your client's uh, UGMA money into a 529. Of course, there are trusts. A lot of families have trusts. Um, uh, these, as you know, can be costly to uh, set up and maintain, and of course they're taxed at the highest uh, uh, income rate, so trusts are not an ideal way to save for college. The good news here, however, is that you can, uh, uh, trust can be an owner of a 529 plan. A uh, few people know this. Uh, and um, as long as the trust was set up for the benefit of the child or the grandchild or whomever, uh, and education being, of course, a, a benefit for that child, then uh, the trust can be an owner. Uh, and um, most uh, 529 plans uh, that I'm aware of do allow uh, the trust to be an owner. Savings bonds, I'm dating myself here, but uh, I even have some of these for my kids. I think I probably even have some uh, savings bonds that I haven't cashed in myself. 
Um, as you know, the government is uh, loath to pay much uh, interest, so this is not an ideal way to save for college. But once again, good news, take savings bond, liquidate it, uh, and it can be put into, the proceeds can be put into a 529. Uh, traditional taxable accounts, of course, can be used, but why would you use a taxable account when there are tax advantage ways, right, to save? Roth IRAs. I know a lot of advisors who uh, think that Roth IRAs are the way to save for college. Um, I personally think it is not a good idea to mingle your retirement and college savings monies in one place. Um, there are also disadvantages uh, to taking out that Roth money and using it uh, for college. Um, so uh, not an ideal way, but, but certainly uh, it is a strategy used by some. Covered L's were a well-intentioned uh, uh, college savings vehicle, uh, and they did get uh, better uh, to the extent that the, they raised the limits on how much you could put in a covered L. Um, but the limits on, uh, uh, are still pretty um, low, uh, $2,000 per year. And um, uh, if you want to use the money for K through 12, uh, you can use a covered L. Uh, but even a private school, uh, elementary school or middle school, for example, uh, I would dare say you're probably not going to have enough money saved if you're only putting $2,000 a year away. Uh, many private schools, K through 12, uh, look like college tuition. Uh, so Coverdell, again, well-meaning, uh, probably not the most effective way to save for college. Uh, and lastly, of course I'm biased, but I will uh, uh, dare say that for most Americans, the best way to save for college is in a 529 plan, either a prepaid tuition plan if you know your kid is going to Florida State uh, because that's where you went, and if they want uh, money from you, that's where they're going, well then a prepaid tuition plan probably makes sense. Uh, but for most of us who want a little more flexibility, uh, a 529 savings plan is probably the way to go. What are the benefits of a 529 plan? Uh, obviously, we've talked about the tax advantages. That's uh, 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 by far the, the, the biggest advantage of a 529. But some people are unaware of the other advantages of a 529 plan, and this is where you as the financial advisor um, can prove uh, your worth in, in showing them just how uh, flexible and advantageous these plans can be. So we've got gifting and estate planning advantages. We'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. Um, Account owner control, this is a little known fact um, that really uh, I think is uh, second only to, to tax advantages in terms of benefit, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more in a moment about uh, the flexibility of 529 plans. Tax advantages, as you well know, at the federal level, uh, you uh, uh, do not pay on any earnings year over year while the money's in there. And then once you take the money out, as long as you use those monies for qualified higher education expenses, there's no tax on those earnings either. And the qualified expenses, of course, are tuition, room and board, fees, uh, books, and any other supplies that are required by the school. And I'm happy to say, if you didn't hear, uh, late in 2000, uh, uh, 15, Congress passed uh, some uh, enhancements to the 529 plan uh, section of the Internal Revenue Code that made computers an explicit expense. I think most people assumed they were and were taking them, but um, uh, if they did uh, get audited and, and uh, said that they used the money to pay for computers, if they had a uh, IRS auditor who was not uh, feeling particularly generous, they probably got dinged on those. But now that's an explicit uh, qualified expense. I do also want to mention, uh, if you don't know, room and board is not limited to that paid uh, to the school. Um, it is only limited by the amount that the school says that room and board uh, costs at the school. So if your client uh, either rents a, uh, an apartment or buys a condo near the school and allows their child to stay in that um, condo uh, while they're in school, the cost uh, of that condo up to, again, the, the cost that the, the, the school would charge that the, the child for room and board um, can be used as a qualified expense. So pretty pretty flexible in that regard. And uh, uh, Steve, and, and um, maybe I'm jumping ahead too much, but um, just as a quick reminder that the um, that the distributions have to take place in the same year as, as the tuition and different expenses are are, are made or paid out. So. Thanks, uh, Paul. You're not jumping ahead at all. I normally make that point, so thank you for, for adding that. So it's important to, to note that um, even if you um, have legitimate expenses, you have to take the distribution from your 529 plan in the same tax year 
uh, as, uh, as the year that the expenses incurred. So uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, I see sometimes FAs calling me saying, oh, my client, you know, forgot to take their money out and uh, now they need to, uh, you know, they want to take money out of their 529, but they incurred the expenses last year. Uh, the, 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 it's bad news, unfortunately, for that client. You have to take the money out in the year that you incur the expense. Thanks, Paul. All right, so uh, at the state level, of course, it differs from state to state, but still fairly generous in a lot of states. Um, and certainly, you're, you're not penalized in, in any state. There was a time when certain states like Illinois would still tax you if you took money out of a 529, but it wasn't Illinois' uh, plan. Uh, but now uh, there's unification across all the states with regard to taking money out of a 529. But in terms of putting the money into a 529, uh, it depends on which state you're in. So uh, there are uh, a, a, more than a couple dozen states um, that either uh, offer an in-state tax deduction or a credit for contribution into the state's plan. Um, uh, and then there are four states um, uh, that offer unlimited state tax deductions. Uh, most states um, uh, offer um, uh, up to uh, either the uh, same limit that applies to your annual uh, gift tax exclusion, which is currently, as you know, $14,000. Um, but, but as you can see from these four states, um, there are more generous uh, state tax deductions. Colorado, New Mexico, South Carolina, and West Virginia all offer unlimited state tax deductions. When we say unlimited, it's generally limited by uh, any gross uh, income, uh, but, um, but that's still very generous. If I uh, have uh, income of $100,000 in Colorado and I've got four grandkids and put $25,000 into each of those uh, kids' um, uh, 529 plans, then uh, I can effectively show zero income for the state uh, that year. So pretty, pretty generous, a very um, uh, generous deduction in those four states. Then we have uh, uh, five what we call tax parity states. These are the states that uh, allow their constituents to put money into a 529 plan, not only in their own state's plan, but any plan. And those five states are Arizona, Kansas, Missouri, Montana, and Pennsylvania. Until recently, that list included Maine, but they no longer offer that. Uh, but, but again, a pretty generous uh, deduction offered by the state um, for, for any state plan. And, and I, I laud these states because they're, they're losing money. They're not only not getting the, the tax revenue, but they're not getting the money uh, that they would if, that, uh, if those uh, 529s were opened up in state. So um, very forward thinking, and uh, I, I uh, uh, hope this trend continues. Lastly, there are 18 states that offer either offer no state tax deduction uh, or they have no state income tax. Uh, but again, for most of our clients, um, between the federal uh, and possibly the state, this is a very generous uh, uh, benefit. Uh, as you don't know, uh, there is a, a special provision in the tax code that allows you to effectively borrow from four future years of your uh, annual gift tax exclusion, which again, as I mentioned, is $14,000. So a, uh, an individual could, could uh, put, five uh, put, put a contribution in a 529 plan, uh, $28,000 in one year and not worry about running afoul of gift tax, or a couple uh, could do $140,000. So if uh, maybe there's a grandparent who has a, a five-year-old grandchild and they're kind of late to the party and want to turbocharge that, they can uh, uh, put $140,000 in uh, for each of their grandkids and, and uh, get that money tax-free compounding uh, right away. Of course, they would be precluded from putting any more money into that account uh, for the next five years, and God forbid they pass away before that five-year period ends. Um, the money, of course, stays in the account, and there's no tax implication for the beneficiary or the parent, uh, but the uh, money, whatever um, uh, year they die in, uh, the, any subsequent years, uh, that, that money would go back into their state for estate tax purposes. Account owner control, I mentioned this is one of my favorite benefits, and this is not well understood, but if, once you put the money into a 529 plan, those monies are outside uh, the uh, estate of the, uh, of, the, um, of the donor, yet they maintain control uh, of those assets and can at any time change the beneficiary, 
They, of course, can change investment options as they see fit. They can even change the owner. You can transfer the money um, in that 529 account, transfer ownership to, to somebody else. And uh, grandparents, for example, do this all the time. They want to maintain the, the account uh, until the kid is uh, ready to go off to college, but then they don't want the administrative burden, so they can uh, name the uh, um, uh, parent the owner uh, with no tax consequence because that money's already been gifted to the uh, to the grandchild. So uh, it's a it's a great way to simplify that uh, administrative burden for for grandparents or anybody who's not the parent. Of course, they can roll over those assets to another 529 plan uh, as long as they haven't. Uh, done a rollover in the previous 12 months, and they can make withdrawals. And of course, they can make withdrawals to pay for education expenses of that beneficiary, uh, but they can make withdrawals for if they have their own needs, be it medical or any unforeseen need, uh, they can take that money back at any time. Of course, if it's not used for college, it would be deemed a non-qualified distribution, and it would be subject to uh, ordinary income tax at the distributee's rate. So if the grandparent takes it back, says uh, to the 529 plan, send me a check for $10,000, the earnings portion of that $10,000 withdrawal would be taxed at the distributee, in this case, the grandparent's tax rate. But what some people don't know is that you can actually income shift. And if, let's say, I um, saved for my grandchild uh, and I thought they were going to go to private school, they ended up going to public school. Uh, they uh, only needed 120,000, but I saved uh, 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 150 thousand dollars in my 529 account. Um, and if I put 100 thousand dollars into that account over the life of that plan, then 50 thousand dollars of that would be earnings, and any distributions come out pro rata. So if I uh, choose to give that 30 thousand dollars that's left over in my 529 account to that grandchild. Um, that, uh, and they don't use it for grad school, but they use it to start a business or something else, used as a down payment on a house. That money, of course, would be then deemed a non-qualified distribution. But remember, I said it comes out pro rata and only the earnings are taxed. So of that $30,000 distribution that is not used for school, 20000 is return of principal, not taxed. 10000 would be taxed. But if I have the 529 plan make the check out to my grandchild and they're right out of school not making much money, they're probably going to be in the 10% tax bracket. So the income tax on that $10,000 of earnings is $1,000. And because the money's not being used for school, um, uh, it's non-qualified, then the earnings would also be subject to a 10% penalty. But again, uh, $10,000 is the earnings portion, so 10% of that is $1,000. So on a $30,000 distribution not used for college, um, uh, I'm only paying $2,000 in the form of ordinary income tax and a penalty. So $2,000 tax and penalty on a $30,000 withdrawal on money that's been compounding tax-free all that time. So um, that may be a perfect storm, but it's an example of the flexibility of, of 529 plans. And, uh, Steve, the, the number of investment changes allowed per year currently and in the HR 529 bill. Yeah, thanks, Paul. That, that's two. Uh, for the longest time, well, for, for, for initially, you couldn't change your investment at all. Uh, it was quite paternalistic. And then in 2006, I believe it was, um, the, uh, the feds uh, cut us some slack and said we could change it once. And then uh, a few years later, they said uh, we could change it twice, and that was um, uh, temporary le uh, legislation, which was later made permanent. So for now, um, c clients can change their investment options. Uh, that, that is to say they can reallocate the money that's currently in their account twice per calendar year. Now, if you at any time decide uh, you want to leave what money is in there but change your future investments, you can do that at any time. Uh, you, can, you can always choose a different investment option for any future or subsequent uh, investment. But uh, to, to Paul's point, um, the, the limits uh, on, on reallocating your existing assets are twice per calendar year. Thanks, Paul. And then lastly, flexibility. So 529 plans, uh, I mentioned um, uh, in Coverdell's, for example, your uh, you're limited to $2,000 per year. In a 529 plan, you're not limited. Uh, you're limited only by the state's uh, 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 limit, which is quite generous in most states. 
uh, over $400,000 in most cases. Um, and um, uh, what I did not mention for Coverdell is that you're actually uh, income limited. Uh, it's a sliding scale, and at a certain point, you can't even put into a Coverdell. But with 529 plans, there are no income limits, and there are no age limits. Um, there is a time restriction in one state, uh, but for all other states, there's no time that money can stay in that account in perpetuity. Uh, so if you don't like your grandkid and you want to wait till the next generation, you can do that. Um, anyone can contribute, um, even an entity, as I mentioned, a trust, for example, can be a, a, an owner of a 529 plan. A lot of people uh, have asked if they could set up a scholarship fund. Um, you know, there might be um, uh, a town uh, that uh, has created a scholarship and, and uh, we certainly will allow them to, uh, to own a 529 plan. So, uh, and, and the other thing that um, wasn't always the case but is in every uh, plan, so far as I know, uh, anyone uh, can contribute to these accounts. So uh, a grandparent can have an account and the parent can contribute or vice versa. Um, you need not be the owner to contribute to the account. And then uh, in terms of where you can use the money, the litmus test is if the school accepts U.S. financial aid, uh, then it is deemed to be accredited and that any expenses uh, paid for out of your 529 for that school would, deem, would be deemed qualified. So that's, of course, colleges, universities, vocational schools, a lot of people don't know trade schools, those also uh, would be deemed qualified. And uh, what a lot of people uh, don't, uh, aren't aware of is the fact that you can m use the money abroad as well. McGill, for example, in Canada, uh, Cambridge uh, in the UK, but uh, over 500 schools currently uh, would be deemed uh, qualified. And the way you would check that is to go to the FAFSA website, um, and you can do it one of two ways. Um, uh, you can actually put in the name of the school into the um, uh, calculator, and if it returns a code, um, then you know for sure that that school uh, accepts U.S. federal aid and that would be a qualified school. But there's also now, I believe, a lookup tool um, and you can actually uh, look on a, on a list of, of schools uh, to determine whether it's a accredited school for this purpose. All right, so um, if you've been convinced of the power of 529s, uh, but you're worried, you're still worried that uh, it's going to hurt your clients, um, uh, chances of getting financial aid, or they are, and you need to tell them why they shouldn't be worried about that. Uh, let's talk about how 529s are going to ex uh, affect uh, a client's uh, financial aid chances. So uh, we, we looked at this uh, table before. What I didn't make clear earlier is that a 529 is actually considered the asset of the parent. And remember, we uh, saw that um, a parent uh, is, uh, is uh, um, uh, in a better pos position, if you will, uh, in terms of the assets um, that are expected to be used for college. You'll remember the child was 20%, uh, was but for the parent, it's up to 5.6%. So uh, as compared to, for example, an UGMA account that maybe somebody opened up for your client's child, um, that would be uh, deemed uh, to be the asset of the child. Uh, so as a, as a parent asset, it is definitely, a 529 is definitely treated um, a better uh, than, than, um, than that of, of the child. What we didn't talk about earlier is the fact that if that 529 is held by a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a friend uh, of the family, um, that is completely off the radar screen for um, the purposes of financial aid. They, the, the, the FAFSA will ask how much the parents have in the bank and how much the kid has in the bank, but not how much the grandparents have uh, in a, in a taxable account or in a, in a 529, so any assets owned by someone other than the child or the parent would be off the radar screen for uh, purposes of, of determining needs-based aid. Um, I will point out, however, if a grandparent opens up a 529 in the, in the name of the child um, and then takes money out of that 529 and gives it to the child for the purpose of paying for college, that distribution is considered income to the student in which the grandparent took the distribution. And you'll remember earlier we talked about when you're filling out that FAFSA, so you'll want, if possible, 
to wait until the student is a junior in college to take that money out of the 529 plan. So use any monies in your five, in your client's 529 before they use the grandparent's 529, and that way it is not deemed to be income to the student. Or, or you know, I guess it's also a good point to also, you know, point in time to also point out the, um, you know, that's the other benefit of having the, the parents, you know, over, oversee the assets, you know, as opposed to the grandparents because, you know, it's, it's beneficial in that, in that one scenario, but obviously grand, grandparents in, in scenario two, so. Exactly, exactly, for the reasons we stated. So in summary, um, divide, d despite what many of your clients think, they're unlikely to get much, if any, uh, needs-based federal student aid. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a very quick antidote. Um, I happened to lose my job, uh, unfortunately, uh, when my first child was applying to school. Uh, so I fill out the FAFSA. Um, I was told uh, I would not get any needs-based aid. Uh, and then I lost my job and my, my, my daughter got into several um, schools and we went around to those schools and met with the financial aid officer and I said, hey, things have changed. I lost my job. You know, can I, am I entitled to any more uh, federal aid than you uh, told me I would get? Uh, and they looked at my uh, FAFSA form, and um, I was told that my uh, FAFSA number was 99999, which basically means there's no school in the U.S. <laughs> expensive enough for me to qualify for aid, and that was even uh, after, you know, losing my job. So uh, a lot of our clients think they're going to get aid, uh, needs-based aid, they might get merit-based aid, their kid might be as, as gifted a, a, a piano player or a linebacker as they think, but they're not likely to get needs-based aid. Um, and if they do, it's probably going to come in the form of a loan or work study, uh, but not a grant that they don't have to pay back. So that's, that's the harsh truth, unfortunately, for many of our clients. And as we just said, uh, if you have a 529 plan account, it's going to affect your client's uh, EFC less than if the student had that money in their name, for example, in an UGMA. Um, and, and certainly far less um, than the parent's income, which is, is what really kills, to Paul's point earlier, the income uh, accounts for so much more than assets. So that's usually the disqualifier right out of the gate. But again, if that 529 is owned by a person other than the parent or the student, it's off the radar screen for the EFC calculation. So remember that. All right, so I do want to point out here, we've got some resources. Um, and. Uh, Paul will make this available uh, um, on, on the uh, Strategic uh, Insight website uh, um, uh, eventually. Of course, we've got to run it through the compliance folks, but um, these uh, uh, website addresses will be available to you uh, if you're not quick enough to, to jot them down here. Uh, but these are some great sources uh, to pass along to your clients. Scholarships, uh, you'd be surprised the things they give money for, so I encourage you to encourage your clients uh, to apply for any and all scholarships. Um, grants, uh, here's the, the, the website where you can find out what grants are available, but again, that's, uh, that's on a needs-based and most of our clients will not uh, be eligible. And work-study information can be found on that same studentaid.ed uh, website. And then, uh, uh, student loans we, we talked about earlier, Perkins loans are the, are the loans, uh, these are all federal loans, but, but the Perkins loan is actually um, uh, administered by the school, they're the lender. Um, and then these other three, uh, the two Stafford loans, one is subsidized, one is unsubsidized, the subsidized is needs-based, unsubsidized is not, um, and, then, and then direct plus is generally for the parents or um, direct to the student if you're in grad school. Uh, but there's, there's the, uh, the facts there on those four loan types. And then, of course, uh, student uh, private loans, rather, are uh, obviously available based on, on the credit of the student or the parent. So uh, you've uh, withstood the 50 minutes of CE training, so you're all entitled to that CE credit now uh, if you want it. Um, but if you'll indulge, I have just a, a quick commercial for the Leg Mason plan. I'll uh, hurry through this so that we can get to your questions at the end of this. Uh, so Leg uh, offers a 529 plan, uh, which has been around since pretty much the beginning of advisor sold 529 plans, one of the first, and we're the eighth largest advisor sold plan. 
Uh, so uh, certainly not a, a fly-by-night uh, offering. Um, and it's not me uh, figuring out uh, which leg funds to put this, uh, uh, the money in, but rather QS, one of our affiliates who is a uh, multi-asset uh, strategy expert doing the um, uh, portfolio construction and they're monitoring the funds on an ongoing basis and we throw funds out if they underperform and, and put funds in uh, that are better performers. So um, it is a, 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 bed, a better performing plan as a result of that oversight that's uh, happening constantly. And it's a multi-manager open architecture plan. Uh, the, the Leg Mason affiliates are listed there, but we also have some non-prop uh, managers in our plan, including Franklin and Thornburg. Uh, so it is um, a multi-manager plan, which I think appeals to a lot of uh, advisors and their clients. We get uh, high marks from savingforcollege.com. Uh, we are currently ranked uh, number three uh, for our performance in the one, three, and five year period, and that's in, including the sales charge. Uh, and uh, we get a five cap rating in Colorado and a four and a half cap rating for non-residents, which is a very high rating for, for non-residents uh, uh, by savingforcollege.com. We have among the lowest fees, in fact, the third lowest asset-based fees among all the uh, actively managed advisor sold plans. We're pretty proud of that. We have no program management fee. And for the leg funds, we use the institutional share class. So uh, very low uh, fees overall. And our uh, pricing is very competitive. A low upfront 3.5% sales charge. And if your clients are fortunate enough to have enough money to pool together uh, $500,000 for a number of uh, grandkids, for example, uh, they'll get uh, NAV pricing at a half a million dollars. And then lastly, our C, of course, has no upfront sales charge like every other C, but we have no back end uh, sales charge either. So um, a, a liquid C offering there. Uh, we have all of the usual uh, flavors of investment options, uh, not only age-based, but also years to enrollment, but we also have static multi-fund portfolios and static individual fund portfolios, and of course, we have a cash equivalent. Uh, should the sky start falling, you've got safe harbor there for your clients. And lastly, I will mention that, of course, uh, as a plan that's administered by the state of Colorado, uh, our Colorado clients are entitled to that unlimited state tax deduction that I mentioned earlier. But then the five tax parity states, Arizona, Kansas, Missouri, Montana, Pennsylvania, your clients in those states could take a state tax deduction even if they invest in the Colorado plan. And then, uh, uh, as I mentioned, unlimited for, for Colorado residents. So, Here's our contact information. Should you have any questions that you didn't get into the live session here, you can certainly email us directly, scholarschoice at legmason.com, or call the sales desk, 800-544-7835, or visit our website, scholars-choice.com. But if you've put a question in uh, uh, during this live session and we don't get to it before the end of our period, we will uh, be sure to answer your questions via email. So uh, make sure you uh, have provided your email address when you register or put it into the uh, question that you send to us. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Tori, who will open up the lines for any questions for either Paul or myself. We are now opening the floor to ask verbal questions. Please use the hand icon at the bottom of the participants panel to indicate that you'd like to speak. And it looks like we have Janet Friedman with her hand up. I'm going to, um, another piece of information, the only way that we can actually unmute your line is if you are called in. You can call in using the event info tab at the top of your page. Uh, while we wait. Questions, Tori. Um, I, I did want to point out one other thing that I neglected to mention that uh, Paul and I just learned at the uh, uh, CSF conference a couple weeks ago. Um, the former head of the um, FDIC, Sheila Bear, spoke, um, and she is now the president of Washington College, uh, and she started something that I hope will catch uh, Fire, but you might want to mention it to your um, 
parents and uh, clients and, and maybe they can put some pressure on the schools that they apply to to follow suit. But Washington College has started something called the Saver Scholarship and they will match any withdrawal that you take from a 529 plan to use to pay for tuition at Washington College up to $2,500 a year. And she's saying that if this is successful, they may even raise that to a higher amount. But that's a pretty generous deduction, uh, or, or match rather. So if you take $2,500 out of your 529 plan, send it to Washington College uh, to pay tuition, they will uh, write down your uh, tuition by another $2,500. So a really generous offering, I think really forward-looking, should do wonders to help encourage uh, people to invest in 529 plans. So I hope uh, that other colleges uh, follow suit. Tori, any other questions? And uh, Steve, that definitely a high rating presentation by, by you, great, great work. Did have a, you know, one question about, you know, the, is, in general, what are the pros and cons of, of grandparent assets versus, you know, parent assets? Do you recommend one or the other, or, or what are the ins and outs? Yeah. I, I, and I see that to be a very common question for a lot of the, the college planners, not college financial planners, but college, college planners that, that, you know, do work with the entire family. Yeah. yeah. What, what, are, what, are, what, what are the key, you know, bullet points on, on that element? Yeah. So, so uh, lots of factors, of course. If you're an FA who just has the grandparent, then I think all the assets should go in the grandparents' account. <laughs> uh, if you're fortunate enough to have, as Paul suggests, uh, clients uh, multi-generational, you might have uh, the parents and, and the grandparents, then, and, and if there's any chance of financial aid, um, then y you may want to more heavily weight the assets uh, for the beneficiary uh, in an account for the um, grandparents. And of course, if the grandparents are looking to get money out of their estate, as we described, it's a great way to do that and yet maintain control. So if the FA has the, the grandparent as a client, um, I, I recommend uh, uh, more heavily weighting the assets uh, towards the grandparent or aunt or uncle or anybody outside of the, uh, of the uh, parent. Yep, and a, and a closely re related question, what, what is the impact of, of, on the financial aid calculation of a, of a um, you know, uh, grandparent making a direct you know, payment to the school? Is that, the, um, is that considered the income of the, of the student, 50% in, uh, income impact um, on the calculation? Do you want to provide some color on that? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, if, uh, if, if, if financial aid is not an issue um, uh, and uh, the, the grandparent has the wherewithal to, uh, you know, just write a, a check out of, their, out of their income or assets, then that's a, that's a great place for people to be uh, because, of course, the, the uh, grandparent can do that with no uh, gifting or tax implications. Um, but yes, it, it is deemed to be income of the student, uh, whether it comes from the grandparent or anybody else, uh, if, they, uh, if they do a direct uh, deposit into, uh, uh, to, to offset the cost of, of, uh, of tuition for that, class, for that uh, bank. Yep, and, and back to the uh, you know, um, you know, parents and, and students, the, um, do you want to touch upon briefly the, the asset protection, the, the income protection piece of the, of the uh, EFT calculation? Or? Uh, 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 so, sure. So, uh, sorry, creditor protection is that what you're referring uh, the, to? The, uh, the, the asset protection, like the, the fir like the first, you know, the little piece of of the uh, you know, assets for the parents, um, you know, not being count counted in the calculation. But just, just, just want to provide a, like a quick. Yeah. Note that there is that that, that concept there. But. Yeah. So, so of course, uh, I, I think I neglected to mention that um, not all assets are considered. Uh, in the EFC, so if you had any retirement assets, for example, um, that would uh, not go into the formula. Um, and uh, uh, for CSS, they're, they're, they do look at things like uh, assets like homes and so forth go into the, to, to the formula. Um, but for FAFSA, no retirement assets. And then, of course, as we discussed, um, uh, up to 5.6% of the parents' assets, but everything else, of course, would not be expected to be contributed to the cost of college. Great. Uh, well, you know, we're at the, the 1 p.m. Uh, mark. Uh, mark, um, want to thank you, Steve. Looks like you have a, your your, your uh, work cut out for you. There are a lot of questions that we did not get to, so uh, please email the questions over to um, you know, like Mason and team. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, listeners. Follow-up email will be sent out, um, you know, shortly uh, at, at some point this week or, or next. Uh, contact us with any questions, feedback, comments to, to either myself or Steve. 
Um, you know, as, as a quick reminder, 529 Conference is coming up in September, www.529conference.com. Have the college financial planning discussion today. Thank you very much, very much for your time. I look forward to speaking at the next um, 529 webcast. Thanks, Thank Paul. Thanks, everyone.